Uh, we'd like to welcome you one and all to this first inaugural webinar of the British Isles Latter-day Saint Association. Uh, today, this very day, is the 104th anniversary of the very first baptisms that took place in Preston, just nine miles north of where we're recording from, 30th of July, 1837. And we're so glad that many of you have joined us for, you know, it's quite a significant day in the calendar, an anniversary. I um, just want to give some thanks uh, first to Barbara Walden and Wendy Eaton. Uh, they're from the Community of Christ uh, Historic Sites Foundation, and they've been doing all the technical behind the scenes stuff. They're still doing it right now, and uh, they've generously shared their larger Zoom facility. We had uh, naively thought, oh, we'll just do 100 registrations and that will um, take care of it, and uh, it exceeded that. So thank you. Um, we are recording this session so that we can then put it out live for, I mean, I mean uh, for anybody else to look at at a later date. If you don't want to be seen, then you've got to remove your name and switch off your video. Um, so if you later want to ask a question, then you can do that through the chat function and add a non for anonymous. So I want to introduce Peter Fagg, uh, who's just been speaking to you. Uh, Peter is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and uh, knows more about British Isles Latter-day Saint history on the ground than anyone else I know. The first time I met Peter was on a tour of the River Ribble baptism site in Preston, Lancashire in 2010. He was also one of our guides on the 11-day Commute of Christ England and Wales historic sites tour in 2017. And that's when we became friends. And Andrew Bolton, who you can see next to me on the screen here, is a member of the Community of Christ. And he was born just up the road here, nine miles away in Preston. He grew up and went to school in the Clitheroe, that's the Ribble Valley area. And he's written papers published in a wide range of journals on Latter-day Saint history and theology. We want to say a little bit about the British Isles Latter-day Saint History Association. Um, it's independent of any church and seeks to involve everyone from enthusiast beginning to scholar in church history in these aisles. We welcome different perspectives and clashing views, but insist always on civility and respect. So say whatever you like, but do say it with kindness and courtesy. This evening, Peter's going to talk about the first mission, 1837 to 1838. And when I'm finished, then Andrew will take over and talk briefly about the 1840 to 41, the second mission, and then explore why the Kirtland Gospel was so attractive to these mill workers in Lancashire and the poor in places like Herefordshire. To help us with the discussion, Gillian Vincent will take the lead. Gillian is a historian, a native of Manchester and Stockport, and used to work for the BBC. And Gillian is going to say a few words now. Gillian? So we want to make sure that um, within this time that we've got together, you'll have about 25 to 30 minutes for discussion. So whilst Peter and Andrew are talking, if you want to put your comments or any questions into the chat box, and then um, when we get to that point, I will relay those questions to them for you. So please do feel free to ask questions and make comments that we can use for our discussion later. So I'm going to hand now to Peter for his topic, his term. Uh, Peter is going to talk to us about uh, the first Latter-day Saint mission for the British Isles from 1837 to 1838. And it's a story that begins right here in Lancashire. Excellent, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen with you all. There we go. Um, in the background, you can see my wife rescuing me a dog just ran in the room and we're getting him out he's exited he's not invited he didn't register Hi. there we go <laughs> so i'm going to be talking um 
about this first mission. It's just an eight month mission, it goes from July 37 through to April of 1838. And uh, we say 1837, but I actually want to jump before that because there's a part of this story that is vital, I think, to understand. We talk about um, divine intervention, tender mercies, the hand of God uh, being led by the spirit. And to fully understand the impact of 1837, let's just jump and introduce you to four families. First up is in Alston. You can see it circled there in yellow, just off to the uh, east of the Lake District. And there is a family called the Russells. William and his wife, Isabella, decided to emigrate, leave this country with eight of their children. And I've listed four of them there because all four of them feature in our story. Uh, so they head off. Then there's another family um, from Hell in the Lake District. We have James and Agnes Taylor and their four children and uh, ages 7 to 20, they go off in the first group. They leave behind John Taylor, who will eventually become the third president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he's left behind to settle up the family estate and farms and all that sort of thing, and then he goes and joins the rest of his family. A third family is down in Bedford, and there you can see the Fieldings, Joseph and Mercy, brother and sister, 10 years apart, they leave, and two years later, you see Mary Fielding, their young, uh, their mid-sibling, uh, decide to come and join them as well. And finally, um, why isn't that allowing me to go down? Let's just have a little look there. Try clicking your mouse, see if that works. Okay, there we go. Um, down in London, Soho area, was a, a married couple, John and Emma Goodson. John's parents and uh, one of his siblings had died in a cholera outbreak in London. They decided to pack bags, leave London, and also head to Canada. Now, all four of those families end up in Toronto. Now, when I prepared this power presentation, the big yellow dot you see there was see-through. But when I transferred it to this computer, you can't see through it now. But behind that yellow dot is hiding Toronto. Um, just established there in the Great Lakes. And they discover that they are like-minded, they start worshipping together, make friends with each other. Let's just leave them in Toronto for a minute, come down to Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, there you can see the other yellow dot. Kirtland is hiding behind Cleveland and Route 90. And there we have um, the temple having just been dedicated uh, in March of 1836. And Heber C. Kimball goes along to the thankful and Parley P. Pratt home, offers to give them a blessing. He says that she will get well, that she will conceive a son, which they had been trying for ages, and that they would then, um, Parley would go on a mission to Canada. Now look at this part of the prophecy here. He says, you shall go to Upper Canada, even to the city of Toronto, the capital, and there you shall find a people prepared for the fullness of the gospel, and they shall receive thee. And from the things growing out of this mission, shall the fullness of the gospel spread into England and cause a great work to be done in that land. So it was quite a blessing. And he then um, follows that council. He heads up, he comes to Hamilton, that's the circled area there. And he's got, if he carries on walking, it's gonna take him a few more days. It's about 50 miles from there to Toronto. And he feels that he wants to get to Toronto quicker. So he decides to go into a wooded area and kneel down and pray for guidance. And as he does so, he says, I asked the Lord for money to help me to cross the lake that would be costing him two dollars to do so. He then goes into Hamilton. He chats with some of the people. He says, I'd not tarried many minutes before I was accosted by a stranger who inquired my name and where I was going. He also asked me if I did not want some money. I said yes. He then gave me ten dollars and a letter of introduction to John Taylor of Toronto, where I arrived that same evening. So he cut a couple of days of journey, but I think that's just an, an amazing little tender mercy there. One, he's given money to this introduction. And so he starts to talk to the tailors about this restored mess message. He's rejected. He tries people around the community, rejected, rejected. And finally, he thinks, I'm wasting my time. I'm going to move on. And this, again, is another fine example. Isabella Russell. She's one of those families that we spoke about moving across gets this prompting that she needs to leave. She says, uh, I've been busy washing over the tub, too weary to take a walk. I felt an impressed to go out. 
I thought I'd make a call on my sister, the other side of town, but passing your door, this is the tailor's door, the spirit bade me to come in. I said to myself, I will go in when I return. She'll go visit her sister first, but she said the spirit said, go in now. I accordingly came in and I'm thankful I did so. Tell the stranger he is welcome to my house. I'm a widow, I've got a spare room, a bed and food in plenty. He shall have a home at my house and two large rooms in which to preach. An amazing little experience there. So here she stops Pali leaving this community. And in so doing, she then joins the church. Her sister joins. Remember, I gave you that list of the, the Russell family. So we've got the two sisters, Isaac Russell, uh, their other sister, Frances, who, again, they, a lot of them have married, plus John and Frances' son and three daughters all join the church. Not only that, but you then have the Taylors join. John Goodson, the Fieldings, Snyder, and a few other families all join. So those four families I first introduced you all join the church at this point in time. Now, let's jump back to Kirtland for a minute. <laughs> I know we're jumping back and forward, but this all makes, um, I think, a great prelude to what's about to happen. Hebe C. Kimball is sitting in that um, uh, podium you can see behind the sacrament table there. And the prophet Joseph comes up to him and he says, let my servant Heber go to England to proclaim my gospel and open the door of salvation to that nation. And Heber just felt totally inadequate. You know, I'm a man of stammering tongue and altogether unfit for such a work. How can I go to preach in that land which is so famed throughout Christendom for learning, knowledge and piety, the nursery of religion and to a people whose intelligence is proverbial? So he felt quite inadequate, but he puts his shoulder to the wheel. And he and another apostle, um, Orson Hyde, are selected. And then Willard Richards is chosen as well to join them. Um, he's not an apostle at that time, but he, he later will be ordained in England while serving here. So that's a nice story. But remember that prophecy? This is the prophecy again. He said the fullness of the gospel spread into England um, would come about because of that Canadian mission. And this is how it comes about. Parley records that several of the Canadian elder, elders felt a desire to go on a mission to their friends in that country. At length, Joseph Fielding, Isaac Russell, John Goodson and John Snyder of the Canada elders were selected for a mission to England. And if you look on there, John Goodson, unfortunately, we don't have a picture of him, but we have the three of the four Canadian converts. Remember Joseph Fielding from Bedford, Isaac Russell from up in Alston, John Goodson from down in London now come and with them, they bring their contacts. So when we get to England, when they finally arrive in 1837, that first mission, that eight month mission, they only cover really four main areas. Preston, because of a connection to the Fieldings, Alston, because of the connection with the Russells and Bedford, because of the connection with the Fielding. The other place they go is the Ribble Valley, but that's just because of converts they make in Preston that takes them up that valley. So in the, I, I don't have uh, time to spend a lot of detail in all four of those, I and mean, each of those is worthy of a, a, a lecture on, on its own. But I briefly want to talk about Preston. I'm not really going to talk about Ribble Valley too much, but Alston and Bedford often get missed out. You know, when I've taken people to church history sites, those aren't often included just because of where they are and, and time constraints on an itinerary. But let's jump in and talk about some of those. So Preston, this wonderful industrial town. I say wonderful. It had been a lovely town in the 1700s. A lot of people had their townhouses here, but the cotton industry transformed it. It became a very unhealthy place and a quite gruesome place uh, to live, particularly if you're working class. And they had 42 working cotton mills as our missionaries arrive in town here and the reason they come here is because Joseph's older brother James was the Reverend James Fielding who had his own congregation this is a reuniting of the brothers who haven't seen each other for uh, quite a while now quite a few years and Reverend Fielding has his own chapel his congregation meet inside of this building this is actually two uh, missionaries of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints standing outside the Vauxhall Chapel. It became almost a, a rite of passage that if you were visiting Preston, you had to get your picture taken where the gospel was first preached in England. And this, um, they arrive on the Saturday and Joseph Fielding records that the next day, Sunday, 
we attended his chapel and there he proposed that we should preach from that pulpit and so he see Kimball get up there he opens the meeting he introduces the fullness of the everlasting gospel and they get to preach three times from the pulpit of Vauxhall Chapel and uh, it, that's an interior shot of the Vauxhall Chapel and um, this is where his congregation who've been prepared unwittingly knowing that their their hearts are going to be open to this new message that was going to come and Reverend Fielding I don't think he quite understood what he was allowing them to listen to and it suddenly made him a bit nervous and this is his response uh, Joseph records the people seemed very deeply impressed my brother again offered the chapel for Wednesday but did not seem to receive our testimony himself and before Wednesday, Wednesday began to wish he had not been so liberal as he did not fall in with us he did not want his people wish that his people should and he could see that it had been taken hold of them so suddenly here he's got a congregation now leaving him and sure enough the following Sunday the second Sunday nine of those um, congregants go down to the river ribble here and are baptized in the river next week 15 more join and he he doesn't have a a positive feeling in fact um just here this is a letter joseph received from another brother called john who still lived down in bedford who heard about what was happening to james and uh, he says he's not happy <laughs> he says i must tell you that nothing in my mind is more prejudicial against you and your profession than your going and interrupting and sowing the seeds of confusion and discord among james peaceable prospering society I highly disapprove under any circumstances of such interference of our denominations of Christians with another as illiberal, cruel and unjust. So he really wasn't too happy um, about them coming in there. Um, that's just another little picture of the Vauxhall Chapel being torn down in the 1960s. And if you want to see the Vauxhall Chapel today, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few bricks that have survived and that's one of them uh, in the Preston chapel yeah. but we could spend a lot of time on Preston but I want to leave Preston right now and go up to Alston uh, Alston is up in the hills it's the highest town in England um, it's a lovely kind of quite bleak area at times and uh, it's uh, not a place that many people tend to go through uh, it's out of the way you know in winter time when it snows there they are blocked off but it's still got a lovely lot of period buildings and uh, Isaac Russell is sent up this is where he's from this is where his family his mother his father um, has still had relatives here it was a lead mining community that's why it was up there in the hills these were the people they would have seen working there um, he didn't get a good reception and as you can see here in his account of his experience, he says, I've never suffered so much in the way of persecution before as I have done here. And there he talks about the fact that uh, the ministers, uh, Church of England, Methodist, and there's a Quaker group there as well, really lay into him. Later on, he, he shares this with Hebe C. Kimball. And Hebe C. Kimball says, let them rant and rave. You back off. You just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, here he records, um, writing to his wife, Mary, back in America. She says, you know, that the priests are really laying into him and that they would gladly take away his life if they had an opportunity. Um, so he's not a very happy um, person in terms of how he's being received by some people. But initially then, he starts to have a lot of success. Uh, 23 the first and eventually gets about 60 people who join the church and part of it was because of this building here it's now a private house uh, changed into multiple homes actually but this used to be the Methodist church and in there lived not lived but <laughs> worked a man called Jacob Pert he says I was chosen superintendent of the Sunday school which numbered about three or four hundred scholars I exerted my influence and got him our Methodist chapel, a very nice and commodious hall. And so Jacob Pert actually is his mother's maiden name, uh, Isaac Russell. And we start then to see him having great success there. Um, let's leave Alston behind. Let's jump down to Bedford. Remember, this is where the Fieldings were originally from. And when they come down there, 
there's their sister and filled and has now married the reverend timothy matthews welcomed them into the church very happy to see them but unfortunately things take a twist first off he bears testimony that what they're hearing from these missionaries is true this is the gospel as taught by the prophets anciently and he says i want you to do the same i encourage you um, to go and be baptized and he also set his own date to be baptized and then he failed to turn up um, and uh, what had happened is that john goodson unfortunately had shared the vision that joseph smith had recorded with sydney rigdon about the three degrees of glory multiple degrees of glory which just kind of didn't gel in his mind most people of course were teaching heaven and hell and that was just a hard one for him to grasp so he never did join but he then started baptizing people for immersion uh, himself getting over about 400 people in the next few years uh, i feel a bit sorry for the fieldings because uh, this is what he wrote as he came aboard um, came across the ocean he said, I hoped they would all come to the same priest that will be connected with it. That was my highest ambition. He's talking about what he hoped his family would do. I prayed much that the Lord would prepare my brethren to receive the truth in its fullness as I had received it. And now suddenly up in Preston, his brother there has welcomed and then prepared these people to listen. And that's where we get our first converts from. And he then rejects the message. The same happens down now in Bedford. And he sadly records in his journal, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien to my brother, mother's children. And I think that's quite a sad entry, really. You know, they desperately wanted his family to accept what he and his two sisters had accepted. But now, of course, um, not receiving that um, as possible. And then, of course, he, before he leaves Bedford, he visits his parents' graves. Those are the two in the middle. And the one on the left is actually Reverend Timothy Matthews and his sister, but that wasn't there at the time. And he says, they died in peace. Neither of them have heard of the fullness of the gospel. And as my friends rejected, I'm glad they died before it, lest they should have been influenced to reject it also. Well, finally, we have a conference in Preston on the April the 8th. This is 1838. Heber C. Kimball is about to go home and leaving Joseph building and Willard Richards and a new convert called William Clayton in charge of the mission. And they stay now until the second mission, main mission comes. But listen to Heber's recording here. He says, by nine o'clock, there were from six to 700 present. This is in the cockpit in Preston. And 700 was about the maximum that building could hold. They had arrived from various parts of the country. The total number of saints represented was about 2,000. The branch in Preston numbered about 400, that in Bedford 40, and the branch in Cumberland, which is Alston, 60. So a really quite significant turnaround. You know, about 2,000 in eight months is a phenomenal um, record, I think. And that brings us, let me stop sharing my screen, to the end of the first mission. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Andrew, who will talk about the 1840 to 41 mission and about the Kirtland Gospel. So I love the stories you've just told, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. So the second mission, and we're going to talk about Lancashire a little bit and Herefordshire quite a bit. And we'll go through the Midlands to get from one place to the other. So back home <laughs> in the States, uh, <clears throat> there's chaos from 1838 to 1839. Joseph and Sidney Rigdon uh, run away from the bank troubles in Kirtland in January 1838. Um, they're paranoid in far west. Sidney Rigdon preaches an awful sermon on July the 4th that really creates a lot of tension with their neighbors. And then um, the Mormon War begins in August and runs to the 1st of November. At the end of October, you have Governor Boggs of Missouri issuing his extermination order against the saints, either leave the state of Missouri or be exterminated. Joseph is arrested with others on the 1st of November. He's nearly shot, but uh, a Donovan, General Donovan intercedes. 
They're in Liberty Jail in awful conditions over the winter until April 1839 and allowed, we think, to escape. And they settle in commerce over the border, over the state line um, in Illinois, and we call it Nauvoo, beautiful place, peaceful place. Um, there's malaria there, there's a housing problem, there's not enough houses, uh, and there are income issues because they're all refugees. It's a terrible situation. Imagine a refugee camp. And yet they still hear the call to go back to the British Isles, which I find extraordinary. So the Council of Twelve are mobilized to do this. Two apostles arrive in January of 1840, John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff. And we've already heard a little bit about John Taylor. He comes from the poorest county in England, Westmoreland. Um, and then uh, in April, April the 6th, significantly, Apostles Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, George uh, Smith, Heber C. Kimball, and Brigham Young arrive in Liverpool. And they meet. They have a Council of Twelve meeting. And uh, Willard Richards is ordained an apostle. So you have now eight apostles serving in the British Isles. And Brigham Young is confirmed president of the Council of Twelve. So assignments are issued. Heber C. Kimball does the rip pressed in the Ribble Valley where he worked before. Orson Pratt is sent to Edinburgh and Scotland. John Taylor, Liverpool, Isle of Man and Ireland. Polly P. Pratt's in charge of publications, Manchester. George A. Smith, intriguingly only 22, is sent to the Pottery, Staffordshire. Wilfred Woodruff, Brigham Young, Willard Richards uh, go to Herefordshire. So this is where Herefordshire is. And for Community of Christ folk, this is where our, our uh, retreat center, Dunfield House, is also located. So it's a significant story that's hardly known in Community of Christ, but it's a really good one. So there's a backstory. The Herefordshire story starts before the main group of apostles arrive. Wilford Woodruff has met William Benbow in Staffordshire. And William Benbow is a new convert of about three weeks when they meet. Wilford Woodruff stays in their home, they become friends. And he tells him about his brother, John. So they go to Herefordshire in March, 1840. And they meet John and Jane Benbow. By April, Wilford Woodruff has baptized 158 people. 48 of them are United Brethren preachers. 200 are waiting to be baptized, and a Thomas Kington is baptized and ordained elder. So Thomas Kington and John Bembo are the leaders of this United Brethren group, about 600 people. They are primitive Methodists, an offshoot from. And primitive Methodists are primitive in the sense they believe in the primitive church. They're restorationists, and they're also working class and have an interest in economic justice. So the United Brethren are open. By June, 33 congregations and 534 baptisms, looking ahead to September, 40 branches and 1,000 members. So an extraordinary work is happening in this part of the world. And only one of the 600 doesn't join the church. Only one's a holdout. So this is the Benbow Farm today. And I think Peter would tell us that it's not this building straight in front of you, but the farmhouse was a bit to the left. So if you walk down from the Benbow Farm, you come to this pond. And Wilfred Woodruff spent a day cleaning out the pond. He needs to do another day today <laughs> to clean out the pond. And this is where the baptisms happen, the first baptisms happen. Um, so you can go to the site here. It's owned by the LDS Church, and it's very nicely kept. If you travel by car half an hour south, you come to Gadfield Elms Chapel. This was a United Brethren Chapel that became LDS. And this is the oldest Latter-day Saint Chapel in the world, folks. Um, it was sold in the 1840s to raise money for immigration to the States. 
um, that then was reacquired by LDS church members and has been restored. Wonderful building to go and visit. Um, in the same place, there are two Chartist settlements. And I'll come back to the Chartists in a minute. W.H.G. Armitage, a British social historian working at the University of um, Sheffield said, this early Mormon mission was the most spectacular harvest of souls since John Wesley's time. And it happened despite conflicts in Kirtland, Missouri, Nauvoo, and the assassination of Joseph Jr. Uh, by 1849 to 1851, there were over 8,000 baptisms each year. The Millennial Star reported in 1851, there were 32,000 members in over 600 branches. 60% of all Latter-day Saints in the world were living in Britain. 80% of all Latter-day Saints were British born and baptized. Why so successful? And a footnote here is that 4,000 had emigrated to Nauvoo by 1844. So that's a third of the population there. So you would hear on the streets of Nauvoo accents like Julian's and mine. So it was an international city with Lancastrian accents. So why so successful context? Non-conformist Christianity. This is non-Church of England Christianity. For example, Congregationalists, Baptist, Quakers, Methodists. And uh, Cowling talks about Southeast England and Northwest Britain. So let me do this. Southeast England is the best agricultural land, has London, Oxford, and Cambridge, and faces the continent, as near as the continent, is still the most affluent part of the country. Northwest Britain is the poorer agricultural land, mostly grass, more hilly can raise cattle and sheep, but you can't grow wheat, barley, or oats very well. So this is, um, Northwest Britain is uh, non-conformist Britain. Southeast England is Anglican Britain, although you find um, Anglicans everywhere. So if you look at 1844, a census of church membership, nearly 7,000 of the members were from, were Northwest Britain. Only 500 were Southeast England. And if you look at this table, a uh, sample of converts by Malcolm Thorpe, 80% are nonconformist Christians. So nonconformist Christians were very important because they were receptive to the Latter day Saint gospel. Lots of Anglicans also joined, but mostly nonconformists. The second thing I want to look at is poverty in the Industrial Revolution. So let's begin with the agricultural revolution. This was the enclosure movement, whereby the land was enclosed, the common land was enclosed, depriving the poor of their rights to the commons, impoverishing them further. And there's a, a rhyme uh, about that here. There's a protest rhyme. They hang the man, flog the woman who steals the goose from off the common, yet let the greater villain loose that steals the common from the goose. This pattern of fields that is characteristically English-British um, is a new phenomenon in the last two or 300 years, resulting from the enclosure movement. Let's move now to the Industrial Revolution, coal and steam engines, canals and railways, making transportation easier, and the industrialization of textiles, iron smelting, and so on, created enormous wealth and great poverty. Um, the ex life expectancy was 38 in rural areas. It was half of that in the industrial slums of Lancashire, Mather, Tidville, Staffordshire, and so on. And on top of all of that, you have the worst economic depression in the 19th century, from 1837 to 1843. And the depression in Britain affected uh, uh, the e economy of the United States and was partly responsible for the failure of the Kirtland Bank. So poverty in the working class, Lancashire cotton workers were poor. The rural poor in Herefordshire, the United Brethren. Unions were beginning as a tool of the poor 
to adjust the, their economics disadvantage. And there was also the Chartist movement, which was to help enfranchise the poor. The Chartist movement was advocating for the reform of parliament, that all males would have a right to vote. There would be secret ballots. Uh, there could be payment of MPs, so working people could be MPs. It was a non-violent constitutional change endeavor, and they created a petition, the greatest petition, of 1848 with six million signatures, and it was totally gone. So sad. Nonviolent constitutional reform. And here's the Chartist demonstration in London uh, just before the petitions um, were presented. This is the actual photograph of the event. The Latter day Saints had a word for this mess Babylon. They had another word for the solution, Zion, which brings us to why um, the early Latter-day Saints were so successful in Britain. First of all, let's look at the messengers. The Council of Twelve in 1840's average age was 32. George A. Smith, 22. Uh, Sidney uh, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball were the oldest at 38. Average age, um, 32. Um, John Taylor, Joseph Fielding, etc., were British. Uh, to be American at this time was a positive thing for the working class. The more affluent would look down their noses at Americans, but the working class thought that to be American was hopeful. These men were experienced, intelligent missionaries, very good ministers. They were poor like the people they served, but they weren't broken. And they had the dream of Zion in their hearts. They were well organized, a superb team. So why so successful? They had a publications program. They started publishing uh, the Book of Mormon, 1841. Uh, this was the presentation copy to Queen Victoria, uh, which is still exists in the Windsor Castle Library. I want to have a look at it. Um, they published a hymnal, which was basically Emma's hymnal from Kirtland with 40 odd hymns of the Polly P. Pratt had penned, some of which are good. And they started a newspaper or periodical called the Millennial Star, which is the longest running periodical amongst Latter-day Saints. Didn't end till 18, uh, till 1970. And finally, why so successful? Because of the message that they brought, Zion. The Kirtland Gospel uh, was brought by people who had seen and practiced being communal socialists with economic justice for all. They, they had a Zion in Nauvoo for people to migrate to and John Moon led the first British migration there on the 6th of June, 1840. The, their message was an amplification of the New Testament in the 19th century context that spoke radically to the condition of the poor. They had a high view of Jesus. The, there was infinite atonement. That means there was grace of an infinite kind for everyone. There's no shortage of grace. The Calvinists said there's not enough grace for everybody. Um, preach the Sermon on the Tenth. Uh, the temple or the mount in the Book of Mormon. Zion is modeled on Acts chapter two and Acts four with uh, redistribution of wealth. The temple is part of Acts two. The first principles of the gospel always led to baptisms. There's an implicit Trinitarianism in their message. Um, there were eight sacramental ordinances. So the ordinances are brilliant or semi-literate or illiterate people because it's the gospel portrayed in drama in a personal way. And I think it's so moving that on Christmas day in 1837, they had a conference at which a hundred children were blessed in Preston. There's a whole lot more one can say to that story. They believed in the worth of souls, section 18 in the LDS document covenants, section 16 in ours. 
and you could participate in this. And an elder in a Latter day Saint elder had as much priesthood authority as an Anglican bishop. I find sacramental authority. I find that extraordinary. And they were democratic. And people had religious experiences that confirmed the gospel that they were hearing. So, and then finally, millennialism. Jesus was coming soon. This mess was going to be over. Zion was going to be fully come. So why so successful? The Kirtland gospel, an amplification of the New Testament in the 19th century context that addressed the issues of the industrial and rural poor in the British Isles was a winner. So I'm going to pass back now to Gillian as I um, stop sharing. Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, lots of great questions coming in um, and some nice comments as well saying great job to both of you. So thank you very much. Um, start with a, a fairly easy one for Andrew, just about the chapel that you mentioned there, Andrew and Herefordshire, the oldest Latter-day Saint chapel. And is it still used as a chapel? It doesn't have a congregation. Um, but I think the LDS Church uses conferences there. And when I've talked with officials, they've said we would be welcome to use it as a, for a conference too. And I've talked uh, with Andrew Fox about that. It would hold uh, about 100 people. And uh, it's a lovely building. Okay. And you can, get in, you can get in if you know enough Latter-day Saint history or Book of Mormon stuff, because that's the key pressing the right numbers on the keypad. Good tip there. Um, the next question, <laughs> I think this could possibly take the rest of the um, session, but um, if I um, maybe put this to Andrew first and then Peter, um, how do you differentiate between the Kirtland Gospel and the Nauvoo Gospel? So um, I've described the Kirtland Gospel um, briefly. Um, it was what was understood in Kirtland. The model was Acts um, for lots of things in Kirtland. And uh, in Nauvoo you have um, innovations. Uh, but I don't want to get so much into that now. But that, uh, Peter's welcome to get into that if he wants to. Exactly. No, I'm, I, I think it, I, I remember when Andrew and I first met, he gave a talk at a sacrament meeting in Preston. And he spoke about how we are uh, two different groups, but we share this common, like a river, we share this common um, base and foundation, even though the tributaries have uh, diverted and gone on divergent paths from each other. And I think the Kirtland gospel is what we mutually share with each other. And then in Nauvoo, that's when uh, things start to move apart a bit. Would that be fair to say? I think you said very nicely, yes. So if you go up the River Ribble, uh, which is a big river in Preston, and a bigger estuary 11 miles wide from Southport to Lytham St. Anne's. But if you go upstream, you can cross the River Ribble when it's a yard wide. And we're talking about early British Isles history, where, which we have in common, as Peter said. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, a question for um, maybe Peter, I think Andrew may have touched on this, but in terms of the numbers that left the British Isles for the US um, because they wanted to go and, and join Zion, I think Andrew might have said about a third of the numbers that were there, but we're talking about quite a substantial number of people. Yeah, uh, during the whole emigration process, if you think in that first uh, the first gathering begins in 1840. There was no gathering in that first mission. And it's not till Brigham Young arrives in 1840 that the gatherings are officially opened. And during that first decade, we see about 8,000 people leave these shores. Um, and by uh, figures vary about how many totally left during the Victorian period. Some will say as low as 65,000. Some will say as high as 100,000. I go for a, an in-between mode of about 85 to 90,000 left these shores. 
then of course we've also got Scandinavian people coming across and leaving from Liverpool as well. Um, so it, it was a there, there was definitely pockets, you know, Preston and Hereford and South Wales. There are areas that certainly um, gave us a lot more emigrants. But it was what's amazing to me is the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And I just discover layer after layer this rich tapestry. There's barely a town or city and even little villages that haven't been touched um, during those Victorian times. Uh, it's just phenomenal uh, where they were gathered in from. So we have to remember that there's a lot of emigration to the States going on anyway. Yes. So it was a phenomenon. Um, what I find interesting, a third of all Welsh immigration was Latter-day Saint immigration. emigration. And uh, the Mormon system was the most economic, the most just, the safest form of emigration because you'd have whole companies that looked after each other. They, they became a congregation on board the ship. They had a, a presiding elder. So there was order. People were helping each other. Uh, women were protected. Goods were protected. And um, um, they got a good rate. And then the perpetual immigration fund was where you could get a loan to emigrate. Um, so I think um, the emigration process was even praised in the British Parliament uh, at the it time. Yeah. So that's a really good story. And there's a, I can't remember the name of the book on my bookshelf by a British academic historian that talks about the emigration. Um, and it's a really good book. So I'll, I'll put it in the message after, after this, uh, this event. I always love sharing a quote from Charles Dickens on the emigration. Um, he wrote a book called The Uncommercial Traveller, and one whole chapter is dedicated to seeing 800 Mormons leave from Shadwell Basin. That's right near the Tower of London. And he says, now I have been aboard emigrant ships before, but these people are so strikingly different. I went over the Amazon side feeling this impossible to deny that so far some remarkable influence has produced a remarkable result, which better known influences have often missed. Which I think, you know, this great Victorian novelist um, kind of bears witness, bears a little testimony in a way of, of what had happened to these people. And Charles Dickens was a writer who was a social reformer in motive, who knew poverty himself. So those words are, I think, a wonderful testimony. So actually, you touched on um, Wales there and Welsh people leaving. And, and what, one of the questions was, to what expen extent did the um, second mission and first mission extend to Wales? So Wales is more is later, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but then in South Wales it goes, and North Wales, it goes really well. And um, the second, the first language, the Book of Mormon was translated into was French, but only by a few months. The second book it was translated in, uh, second language it was translated into was Welsh. So the Welsh story is a wonderful Latter day Saint story or set of stories. And so that's going to be uh, webinars in the future. Watch this space. <laughs> Peter, you may know more about that. Yeah, so the first Welsh success was actually in North Wales, um, in Overton area. And we get a branch of about 150 up there. But by the time Dan Jones, the famous Welsh missionary, appears, um, the South Wales has become all important. And uh, that's where the big success happens, all in the Merthyr Tydfil area, multiple branches of the church established. Um, it was um, really quite phenomenal what they did down there and part, part of their power was the fact that they could speak to the English because there's lots of English people down there but they could speak to the Welsh and Dan Jones and consequent editors that followed him had the ability to do rebuttals and do scriptures and hymn books. Peter, yeah. Peter I've got seven pioneers on my Welsh side that went to America from from Merthyr Tiddle around that area. Oh, cool, cool. Um, 
just a comment here, um, just pass on the comment from James Perry that he believes that Welsh was an early translation, but he thinks Danish might have come before the French or Welsh. Uh, so we have to, have to, to research look at. that. One yeah. to look at. Sounds and like an Olympics moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And there are some questions, um, Peter, about who the names of the people who were baptised first. So somebody's asked about in Preston, was it George Cannon? You know? No, it was George Watt. Um, George Cannon doesn't uh, join the church until 1840. Uh, George Watt and Henry Clegg have a very famous foot race to the water's edge to have the privilege of saying I was the first British baptism. Um, so he was number one. Number two was a man called Henry Clegg, who doesn't st remain in the church. He's buried not far from here in Walton Liddell, but his two sons do um, emigrate uh, across. <laughs> Sorry. So you've actually, you've actually answered um, another question there. Somebody was saying they'd heard that Henry Clegg had kind of turned away in anger. Um, so that's, uh, that's how you understand it. it. It's, well, it's an unsolved one because Henry Clegg, when you list, see the list of the first nine baptisms, his name is not listed there. Um, but uh, he's, he is listed as receiving the priesthood shortly after. So I, I suspect there are actually 10 baptisms that first day. I can't see him kind of going, oh, well, I didn't come in first. I'm not getting baptized. I'm walking off. Uh, so I, I suspect he was baptized that day. Um, but they're saying it took another 20 years before his sons were able to emigrate because they were just so poor. They couldn't afford it. And it wasn't until the handcarts were introduced that they could then um, take up the call to emigrate and gather. Wow. So there were people who wanted to emigrate and spent a lot of time raising the money so they could go. Yes. Yeah. So there's a question about um, the this sort of attention that all of this got from, um, from the UK and across England. So did the religious movement get any national or widespread attention? You've mentioned Charles Dickens, so obviously something. And what did people say? What news was sent around England about them? This is, I think you need to introduce what we're gonna do next, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> so shall I do that introduction then? I think, I think so, yes. Yeah. yeah. So. We have a delight for you. So we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, on Friday, the 24th of September, 2021, we have uh, Pete Gaffney presenting on socialism, chartism, and Mormonism, re-evaluating Latter-day Saint conversion in England, 1837 to uh, 1850. Now, Pete, um, is a proper historian, <laughs> got a first class honours in history from York University, a master's degree uh, from Liverpool University in slavery studies, and he's been researching 600 newspaper articles during this time, newspaper articles and, and stories, uh, 600 of them, about what they're saying about the Mormons. So Pete will answer that question uh, fully uh, on September the 24th. To look forward to, thank you. And um, another question here about the numbers, um, Andrew, that were on the map that you, actually it might have been Peter, sorry, that were on the map that you showed earlier. Um, were those numbers actually numbers of converts in the areas? Is that, is that what they were showing? So um, the numbers that I showed were the 1844 uh, conferences um, around the British Isles. So at the conferences, I think they probably did a, 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 a roll call of numbers of, branch, num numbers of branches, numbers of members in each branch. I mean, because Latter-day Saints were quite good at doing the statistics from a very early time. So that would be characteristic of them. Great. Question for Peter. 
about the Alston branch that you mentioned and do we know much about the emigration of the Alston branch and how it affected the local community? Yeah, there's uh, a few key families. So Jacob Pert was one of them, as I say, he and his family. Peter Morn was another one. There was the Thompson family. Um, how many, I couldn't off the top of my head tell you precisely how many of the 60 leave and, and disappear, but they, they do have a bit of a challenge. There's a bit of Isaac Russell seems to fall away from the church for a bit and cause some issues back and forward. And Willard Richards goes and repairs some damage that seems to have been caused. So there are, there are some roller coaster moments up and down, um, but they, uh, yeah, I, I can't think off the top of my head, the numbers of how many of those 60 actually left. Uh, but I do know uh, Jacob Pert, I remember his story, really quite tragic, actually, because he leaves with his wife and his children, at least three children. And when they get to Nauvoo, they're caught up in um, swamp fever and different things. And his wife and three children all die very shortly after each other. Um, he goes on and remarries and has um, generations go from him. But that was, again, a bit of the old thing. Thank you. Um, I, I think we're probably drawing towards the close, but there is there is one question that somebody's asked about whether the slides might be shareable, whether people could have those. Is there a way? Or... So I could. What do you think, Peter? Yeah, I mean, they know it's been recorded. Is that what they're saying, or they want? I think. I suppose they could go back to the recording to have a look, but I, I, they're asking, I suppose, whether they could have the slides, whether they could okay. download them from anywhere. Um, we can look into that. I, yeah, so our emails are going to be on here. They can contact us if that's something they would like to do. And we can talk about that. Great. Well, believe it or not, that's kind of our time has, has very quickly run out. So thank you so much. And um, I will hand back to Peter. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for today. Our inaugural webinar of uh, the British Isles Latter-day Saint History Association. And as we, again, consider 184 years since those first baptisms took place. Uh, we do ask for your feedback. And so on your screen right now, um, what have we done well? What could we improve? We'd welcome your suggestions. Do you have any future topics you think you'd like to see in more depth or other areas, um, et cetera? And other presenters, do you know somebody that would be willing to present something they found or uh, would you like us to hunt some people? We've already got some ideas, as you've seen. Um, our email addresses are there and uh, please email us both and let us know what you think. So just to give you a bit more time to get the email addresses, and I'm sending out, um, an email after this, so it'll have our email addresses on. Um, so um, we want to keep in touch. And just to remind you that Pete Gaffney is speaking um, uh, on the 24th of September, and we'll send more details about that as well. We've recorded this session, and we'll send a link uh, uh, to that recording in due course also. We do thank you for joining us today. I want to thank Barbara and Wendy from behind the scenes for allowing us to use the Community Christ Historic Sites uh, Zoom account, which has a capacity of 500. <laughs> so uh, it was very helpful today. Um, thank you for doing the tech stuff behind the scenes. Thank you, Gillian, for, for hosting the questions. And Pete, Pete, uh, Peter, uh, Fag is just a dream to work with. Thank you, Pete, for co-presenting uh, tonight. So we wish you a good day wherever you are. Some of you it's afternoon, perhaps some of you it's morning, and uh, we look forward to meeting you in September.